I'm sitting here with Rosie Mutene, an award-winning TV actress, film producer, and many other exciting things that she'll tell us all about. And she's author of a new book, Reclaiming the Soil, uh, a black girl's struggle to finding her true African self. Thank you for, for your time. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Okay. Now, um, how long did it take you to, to put it all down in this book? I mean, it's your life story from your childhood up until now. Mm. It started, the journey started over 10 years ago. And it initially started out of therapy and counseling for myself because I realized I needed to deal with certain betrayal that happened in my life and, and to, to, to basically reclaim my relationship with my parents. And then the writing started and then it stopped for a while and then it started again. Mm -hmm. So I'd say from, from beginning to, to the time it actually got published, uh, from the time it was actually completed, 10 years, and then uh, two years I sat with it. <laughs> it was a real journey. Yeah. yeah. Yes. So your mom was working for this family mm -hmm. and they raised you. Mm -hmm. You got everything that any girl could dream of. Mm -hmm. um, Material-wise, the best schools, did it also come with a price? I definitely would say, and I say it came with a price from both families, because there was sacrifice from both families. Uh, sacrifice from my biological family because the, the education and the lifestyle they would never have been able to afford. But allowing somebody else to raise their child in their way, um, only now have I realized, was a huge sacrifice to mm -hmm. them. And then from my foster family, it was a white family in the midst of apartheid. Um, and you had you had this black child. It was going against the grain. It was going against societal norms. Mm -hmm. So definitely, it, it came at a price because then they were also, I'm sure, they were in fact ostracized and criticized for what they were doing. Mm -hmm. Yet my biological family didn't have any say in my language, in my in my upbringing, in my in my tradition, in my culture, and all of that. Mm -hmm. <coughs> there's a there's a part where your mom, you and your mom, have to go to Puking. Mm -hmm and you get off in town by uh, close to Brie takes rank. And the way you described how she put the bags on her bag and, and one on her head, and I could almost see it. Mm -hmm. And she was a strong woman, wasn't she? Well, she is, she's yeah. still alive. She, she's still is alive, um, incredibly strong woman. And just like every woman out there, but, but I think the strength of the African woman is totally undermined in our societies. And so now the image plays through me, and that was one of the scenes that took me a while to actually write because I realized when I put it down to paper and started visualizing it, actually the strength of my mother at the time. So every single day she worked as a maid, then on her way home, she still was working. So she piled this on top of her head and then had to deal with this brat who didn't want to be around, you know? And I think it's a, I mean, I think, I know, I think it was, it was very tough during that time in apartheid South Africa where you were not allowed into certain places. So it was always a struggle with your friends. You would go to a place and the next thing, oh, this black girl can't come in. Yeah, yeah. You know, I'll never forget in the newspapers uh, where, where you've got the, the cinemas, where like, so you'd have Crest, Santa and, and so forth. And at the top of where the movies would be, there was always a sign that would either say all welcome or not welcome. And I'll never forget as a child, like when I wanted to go see a certain movie with a friend, we'd have to go check if that cinema would allow black people into. And certain areas, obviously, you know, in the south of Johannesburg, they didn't allow black people mm -hmm. into. So I remember Cresta, Cresta, Rosebank, Sanson were safe places um, that, that we were allowed to go into because it was written in the paper. And sometimes you said your foster mom would call the restaurant prior, finding yeah. out if they could bring you. Yeah. And, and, you know, there was, there was a, a, a beautiful restaurant and it was my first introduction into, I suppose, the luxurious side of life and, and realizing that I have a quite an expensive uh, palate. But um, when I first tasted prawns and there was this well-known restaurant downtown, it was called Norman's Grill. And I remember it was somebody in the foster family calling through to make sure, you know, can she come? And I heard them saying, no, it's a young black girl. She's a child. And, and, I can, and there was this conversation going, but I was allowed to go. But that was the norm. That was, you know, certain places, you know, you were allowed in. There was, there was a, another game that they used to play with me with the census. So every now and then somebody would come to the property to check how many black people were on the property. Now, I was there legally for many years. So it was a game that I played that I'd go down to the cellar. And, and, and we had to be very, very quiet while this man went through the house checking on how many black people there were. Um, so that was, that, was, that was, you know, that was the norm of, of, of apartheid South Africa. I think, and back at home, in your immediate household with your foster family and your original, well, biological family, mm. it, 
was it a complex childhood that you had? Well, in terms of in terms of the home in Emerentia, it was now looking back was crazy. Uh, you know, as 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 in most houses still today, unfortunately, you have the servants, the domestic workers, the gardeners, and so forth in the back room. Uh, usually, the, the 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 toilet and bathroom is separate from their room, so it isn't a proper house. Mm -hmm. And then you have the main house. Uh, so I grew up that way. Then, at, uh, then as I, as I grew older, I was allowed access to the house and sleep in the house. Then I finally got my own room. Uh, but then when I got home, it was a two-roomed house. And we all know what the difference between a two-bedroom house and a two-roomed house, you know, uh, which, which my parents lived in, in, in Pugeng. And later on in life, my mother saved up a lot of money and ended up building a, a bigger house on, 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 on the property in Pugeng. So at the age of 38, you decide, I want to know who Rose Motine is. Mm -hmm. Debo Rose, uh, yeah. you, yes. <laughs> you wanna, I want to know who this woman is, my roots, my Setswana language, mm -hmm. my being but, a Motswana person. Mm -hmm. um, what had ignited that? Yeah. You know, God gives you signs all along, and it's always us that we decide to ignore them. We think that we know better. We try and run away from them. But it got to a point where there was a lot of emotional turmoil in my life. Um, there was a little bit of financial upheaval. I was a bit confused. In fact, I was very confused in terms of my identity still, yeah. but I was acknowledging it. And as I said, you know, God puts you into situations where he needs to teach you a lesson or show you the right way. And I was driving on the highway and I got a sharp pain on the left side of my body and I pulled over and a sign, something said to me, you need to go home. Mm -hmm. And I called mama and she was in Pugging. I said, ma, I need to come home. And I didn't explain. She goes, my darling, it's your home. Come anytime. And at that point, I remember seeing a sign, extra, extra space. And I don't know where the name and the number came through and I called them, put all of my stuff into storage, packed up what I needed into my small little car and I drove home. And for me, it was not just about me trying to find my identity, but it was also creating that relationship with my parents that was never there. Mm -hmm. Granted, I'd known them throughout my heart. My, my, there, wasn't there wasn't a proper relationship. And only whilst I was there, and it was supposed to be in my mind, I was going to be there for two, three months. It lasted 18 months. Yeah. Because while I was there, I realized that for so long, I'd actually resented my biological father. I'd compared him to my foster father, who was an amazing, amazing man for so long, but without realizing it. And then once I acknowledged that, I got over that, 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 that challenge, I got over that, that stumble, I then started to see the phenomenal, powerful man that he was. Uh, there was one conversation where he broke out into song and, and he was this beautiful baritone voice. And I was like, okay, well, that's where I get my, my creative side from. You know, and, and, and also realizing the fact now, yes, I've, I'd been home on holidays, I knew my parents were, but my mother, ne my parents never ever scolded me, so they never disciplined me. I was never taught about African tradition. I never lived under their roof per se. So at the age of 38, I was driving home to, to live this, but also moving, moving to a village, village life. I'm a, I'm a city girl. I like my Tasha's coffee. I, my friends are down the road. So it was, it was dealing with that, and then, of course, the language barrier, and then, of course, dealing with the changes in the environment. But I knew that for my own sanity, it was something that needed to be done. Now, the termination, um, a decision that was made on your behalf, mm. in which you took no part. Mm. How, have you dealt with that? I now have. And that was also one of the major struggles with, with, when it came to the writing of that. And initially, I actually wasn't going to put it into the book. And once again, God shows you another sign. And I got to the privilege of interviewing Zolega Mandela on her book, uh, When Hope Whispers. And I remember reading her book and another book, uh, Malala Yousafzai's book, I Am Malala, during a very, very difficult time after the, the Botswana incident. And I remember reading, reading um, Zolego's book and I was really, really intrigued at the fact that she was incredibly honest about the drugs, about the sex, about everything. And from, from somebody who comes from such a prominent family, was she not scared? Mm -hmm. And that was one of the things that I asked her in an interview. And she said to me, she goes, if you're going to tell your story, you need to tell all truths, the goods, the, the good, the bad, the uncomfortable, the happy, sad, because if you're going to put your story out there, it cannot be biased. Mm -hmm. And that's when I went back to my drawing board and I was like, okay, let me deal with this. And that's when I realized also I hadn't really dealt with it. Mm -hmm. You know, I understand where, where the family were coming from because in terms of my future, in terms of my life, um, with me having a child, but I hadn't really dealt with it on a psychological and an emotional level. And also it made me realize was that I was allowed to mourn for it. Mm -hmm. I hadn't mourned for my child. You didn't, you didn't I hadn't, yeah. you know. 
Um, and because it happened so quickly and because we had, we, we had identified the fact that I was pregnant very, very late in the pregnancy, so, so, so I, we didn't have like a couple of months to, 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 to think about it or, or, or so forth. But, but that took a lot of time and that took a lot of crying. It took a lot of light writing letters to myself. It took, uh, even, even up until beginning of this year, I realized that there was just that small little end of my saying goodbye where I literally sat in a therapy session with somebody where I actually had to hand over my child to God. Mm -hmm. You know, um, and, and that's, why, that's why I thought it was also very, very important to put it in there because termination of pregnancy is your own choice. So yeah. people need to understand it is your choice. But understand the ramifications that they, 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 they do go with that emotional choice. And, and that's why it's so also very, very important to be teaching the sexual education beforehand. I came from a private school. I knew it. I thought it wouldn't happen to me. It did happen. But, but when these type of things happen is that look at all areas. You know, I'm, I could have possibly had the child and then given up for adoption, but then I would have had to deal with with that emotional trauma of handing over a child or, you know, so all of these different things. But, but it was a very, it was one of the most difficult journeys that I did have to go on to. And as I said, it took a lot of crying. It took a lot of writing, tearing up pieces yeah. of paper, being angry at myself, being angry at the family, being angry at the system. Because, you know, when, when the whole thing happened, it was, it wasn't you go into therapy, let's discuss this, go to therapy, but you need to say, uh, use the word suicide in, 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 in the discussion because the law stated that, because it was illegal at the time, so the law stated that, that the psychologist had to deem you unfit to be a mother. Oh. So in my, in my discussion with the psychologist, I, was, I had to use these words. So then he wrote down, no, she's, she is suicidal. And it wasn't true. No. She At all. But I was in that, it was in dire straits. I didn't want, I, I, I thought, well, I can't have this child. I was, I was ashamed. It was... It was also this man that I thought that I'd loved who had also beaten me up. So where, where was I? So it, it just, there was no, and there was no proper emotional support after that. Yeah, after that, life went on. Life went on. And so that's why when I found power, I could deal with the abuse side of it. I could deal with the fact, okay, well, um, I, I, I'm not blaming myself for, for, for the fact that he beat me. But I, I, I pushed down and I suppressed the feelings of, I gave up a life. And that, that in itself is very, very difficult. Yeah. Now, um, your foster mother mm. wants to kill herself mm. because her son is marrying a black woman. Yeah. And now the issues of racism come to start to bubble up. Yeah. And how did that make you feel? How, and I remember you say she, you, you told her, but I'm black, what's the problem? And she mm. said, but you're different. Yeah. You know, that, 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 that term, you're different, yeah. I hate it. I'm still trying to deal with those, with, 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 with those words because it also, it was a realization in my life that as much as I'm a public personality and, and I have a voice and I've changed lives outside of my personal life, within my personal space, people don't see me. Yeah. And I realized that that place where I, where I was within the family would never be on the same par as the brothers and sisters or the, or the, or the white people in the family. Yeah. And that, that day when it happened, and I'll never forget, it was around the, the Jewish Passover time, and, and the words was, well, I don't want a black woman in the family, and I'm like, but I'm black. I'm your daughter. Yeah. You raised me. Hear me. Yeah. And that, that was very, very difficult for me, because it was the realization that my, for many, many years, my, I pushed my biological mother to the side, and always put my white family first. And yet I was never ever seen. I was more of the doll, the prop or tell people and brag about you. But when it's something so serious and something so sacred, let's at least sit down and talk about it. Yeah. And, and I, that was never granted. If you want to get the book, Reclaiming the Soil, all of it, it's in here, get it. Where can, they, where can we find it? Uh, it is at Exclusive Books, uh, across Johannesburg, across Cape Town. It's at the African Bookstore in Bramfontein, um, various uh, independent bookstores as well. It is going to be online. Please bear with us um, probably uh, within the first week of June. Otherwise, contact Porcupine Publishers, which, which, we, which they have it, and then my email address, in my, my, my website is rosemuthena.bi. I commend you for going on this journey. It, it is very inspiring. And lastly, what's your advice to young girls who are battling with identity? I mean, these days, uh, a term identity crisis is loosely just, um, yeah. so how, what's your advice? How, how, how to best deal with it? Yeah. You know what? It's not just about young girls. It's everybody. 
Um, I dealt with mine throughout into my 30s. So sit down, go to the root, go to the core, find out who you are, ask questions. Uh, you need to know your identity. If you're going to be bringing a child into this life, they need to know who they are and where they come from. If you don't know, even at the age of 55, find out. Find out. Find, it's okay. Um, don't be too hard on yourself. Thank you so much. Your social media platforms? My, all, everything is Rosie Mutene. So I'm on Facebook, I'm on Instagram, I'm on Twitter, I'm on LinkedIn, I'm on Tumblr. My website is rosiemutene.biz. Reclaiming the soil, check it out. I am Rufilo Tobeja, Eyewitness News Sentinel.